Hi everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have the privilege and honor to have Lama Surya Das and we are going to be talking about all the different ways that we love. Um, so we were just talking about that in the first segment about uh, Lama Surya Das's trip um, from back from Nepal and uh, and your new idea of living for love. Live to love? Live to love, yes. Not really my idea, but um, I'll, I'll try to align myself with it. Yeah. It's my old Lama friend, I guess you could say teacher, the Gyalwan Gupta's tenure project and motto. Now, um, mm -hmm. sort of uh, love in action, compassion in action, mm -hmm. service, altruism, and living to love, not for other, perhaps, let's call them lower or lesser, more selfish purposes, but living to love and to love yourself and accept yourself and love others and love life and love all the different species and creatures. And is that spiritual and the love? environment. Would you describe well, it as spiritual love or what is that kind of love? I would say that that's Buddhist love. That's Buddha love. But it might not be different than Christ love. I don't know. You know, like, it seems to me that love is a big word. We all know there are words like this, you know, God is love, God is truth, even God or Buddha. You know, these are very big words. They're more like placeholders. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say nobody really knows what they mean. How about everybody has a slightly different interpretation or understanding right. of right. such big placeholder words or ideals. Yeah. But love is a very transcendent principle, a cosmic principle, a universal principle, obviously. Right. Mothers love their children generally speaking, including in the animal kingdom, not just yeah. human, and probably the insects and the fish, you know, all the, right. the species, all the beings. So, but there are different kinds of love, which is really what you're asking. Yeah. So, you know, there's like, I love chocolate, I love ice cream, use of the word love. And there's, I love you, you know, when you're six or eight years old, yeah. kind of like to your, I don't know, next door neighbor, boy, girl, or other, or to right. your dog or cat. Well, cats, I don't know. Dogs love, yes. <laughs> me, dogs, good. <laughs> you know, there's puppy love, in, right. no pun intended. Yeah. Infatuations and crushes. It's kind of a spectrum. And they're all connected, but, you know, puppy love, and there's fraternal love, paternal love, maternal love, right. familial love. And, and then there's, you know, like teenage crushes and love and lusty love. Let's not ignore that. Right. But, you know, I love you. Sometimes it means I lust you. Right. Yeah. And then there's more like mature adult love and committed love and loving and love making and, of course, sexual love, which right. may or may not be, you know, the same as what we just said, adult right. love. And then there's committed long-term relational love. You know, and then there's uh, more subtle things that we could grow into, like adult relational love or intimate love is, is is huge it's beautiful it's it's kind of required in a way in life i think to be happy yeah i mean may may you all experience it but maybe there's more after that once we grow up you know like spiritual love unconditional love jesus love buddha love divine love like really big love mm -hmm. unconditional love so in buddhism that's what we call unconditional love and compassion or kind of selfless love. Mm -hmm. It's a little idealistic to say selfless love, but that's what it is. It means like, um, I don't know, what did Jesus say? No man, I, I don't know. The point is Jesus said something in a beautiful quote that I'm not recalling right now, that to, to really love the way I love you is that you would give your life for another. Mm -hmm. That's real love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the greatest of all short stories by Count Tolstoy called Master and Man, where a very selfish landowner is totally transformed by getting lost in the snowstorm with his servant who he treats like junk his whole life, but he ends up giving his life for that servant. And mm -hmm. He has like a spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After abandoning the servant in the snow and by chance in the circles, he gets comes back and he saves the servant's life and dies lying on top of him to save the servant's life. Yeah. And, it, no, you know, we could love that much. Like a, a, a parent would give up their life to save the child yeah. and, and sometimes does. Yeah. So that's like big love, selfless love, and the divine love, unconditional love. And I think that's something that we overlook and we forget about. 
that yeah. human love is something we all want and seek and, you know, fight for and cry about and country songs are written about. And, you know, <laughs> it's so important to us. Yeah. Of well, course. To, well, to me, I know you're you... married. It's important to you. Yeah, and I'm not well, saying it isn't. But it's kind of the tip of the iceberg of divine love where you could really, I don't know, what's the word, enjoy or savor or delight in everything. It doesn't mean you're always smiley, happy, Pollyannish. Right. But you appreciate the gift, the miracle of everything, every moment. Like the mm. Christians say, thank God for whatever comes, not just for the good. Right, right. So there, And surrender so your own selfish will about what about me and what I want and my preferences and my little limited agenda. But, right, right. you know, not my will, but thine, O oh Lord. I'm giving you the Christian story now because it's. Because it's Christmas and I'm thinking right. about Jesus, I guess. Yeah. Not my will, but thine, O oh Lord. Not that you become like a doormat. Not that you need to be taken care of. But that you're a little less willful, stubborn, and selfish. That's a direction I want to advocate. And that's what this is about, living to love. Yeah. And to connect. And to merge. And to commune. And to relate. And to be feel the connection. Mm. Not just make a connection as if it's false and you have to fabricate it. I feel the connection with you, CJ. And we talk every year. Mm. And I like you, and I love you in my way. You know, yeah, you're a lovely person. I love doing this with you. Mm -hmm. And this is great. What's not to, not to love? Right. And we can all follow our hearts in the passionate love stories of our life, not just with other people, with pets, with, with green and growing things, with the universe, with the stars, with beauty, with poetry, with service. Yeah. You know, some people love their craft or, you know, of course, love family and you know, love homeland, love love the land they're on. This is beautiful. These are all ways of loving that's far beyond making love right. and seeking satisfaction and then being dissatisfied till you can get it again. Right. That's very staccato. Right. But this is a much more holistic, integral loving where you can be feeling the heart openness every moment and every day and really live to love. And that's kind of your... I don't know, it, we'll put it in like very crass terms anyway. That's your goal. That's right. your mission. That's your code. That's what you live for. Kind of, you know, this is ideal. We don't really know that much about Jesus and Buddha. We weren't there, but that's what they live for. Yeah. yeah. Love and is probably the heart message of Jesus, we could say. We could say it's truth. We could say it's God. I don't know. But, you know, love is pretty much what we think of when we think of Jesus. That's what I think of. Is that his you know, main message with or without the church or the history or before the church, before Jesus was born, love is and was the message. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And it still is. It's the message now. And it's a universal evergreen message, obviously, not just on this side of the world or in some pocket of religion. Mm -hmm. Love. So selfless love. Oh, I'm echoing. Selfless love seems to be uh, hard to do, right? I mean, it's it, like all yes. the other definitions of it's you know, an the, ideal. Yeah, the it's human love. Ideal. The human love seems to me to be about something else completing you. That you're not complete without having another. You know, the puppy, or you know, it's it's an identified love. Whereas this other love is this more transcendent love. But how yes. does one get there? You know, I understand. I can. Understand it's a journey. Conceptual. It's a path. Yeah. That's why people spend their life doing it, you know, yeah. uh, praying and, and doing good deeds, you know, faith and deeds, as they used to say. So we would say in the absolute level, tuning into what's there, yeah, feeling the love, being the love, and in the relative level of deeds, right. loving actions, love in action, compassion in action, rather than hate and harm, but helping, altruism, right. unselfishness, you know, selflessness sounds very high in idea. Right. Also, we need to have a healthy, individuated, adult self to function. But there's also the unself, the transpersonal part that can be unselfish. Like yeah. when you, you give yourself, you know, to some, like some people give their life to save their five or ten buddies on the battlefield or in the ship or in the disease, you know, or, or I don't know, Jenner or these scientists would inoculate themselves with smallpox to try to find right. a cure to smallpox. Yeah. You know, these are selfless acts. People actually do them. Right. Now everybody says, oh, including you, how could you be that way? Right. I'll tell you how. Everybody can. I'm not saying this is something that's kind of common, but we all have this in us. If we have kids, when our kid's lying in the hospital bed 
almost every parent would say, I wish I could get in that bed and have that disease and they could run out and go and play. Yeah. That's yeah. selfless love. Yeah. There it is. So how do we spread that from the narrow circle of our most beloved ones, our kids, or perhaps, you know, our, our dog or someone? Right. <laughs> Widen the circle of loving. That's, I think, the work and that's the path. Yeah. And that's how we can cultivate bigger and deeper and more unconditional love beyond like and dislike. So in spiritual traditions, there are practices for that, like in Buddhism, which I know you want to hear about. You know, there's ways, there's practices to cultivate unconditional loving, compassion, loving kindness practice, wishing well for others, loving kindness, metta, mm -hmm. loving kindness is one of them. Mm -hmm. And then compassion practices, feeling what others feel, empathizing and being moved to help. Karuna, compassion practices, mm -hmm. and equanimity or, or impartiality practices so we can treat, we can equalize ourselves and other, not always good for me and, you know, less for you, like competitive right. mind. And, and so equality, and a, there's a joy in this that we cultivate, so it's not a sacrifice. Right. So what I just mentioned, actually, sneakily, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and impartiality are four faces, four arms, four aspects of Buddhist love. It's called the four boundless, or the four hartitudes, the four Brahma Viharas, the four divine abodes. Yeah. It's how, in Buddhist talk, it's how the gods roll, the divine abodes. It's how they <laughs> live. Compassion, <laughs> loving kindness, joy, and equal to all. Okay, well, how I, can I, we I, call it an unconditional love or compassion if it's not equal to all? You see. Yeah. So this should go together, theoretically speaking. So we work on those with different practices, like wishing others well is continuously, explicitly is how we cultivate love and kindness. Compassion by empathizing, feeling what they feel, and trying and actually, to help. Let's, let's actually in the next segment talk about that, because I'd like to understand okay. more one of those practices. Yes. That we have and I've written about this in Awakening the Buddhist, Buddhist. Heart. These four, they're actually, yeah, they're in little chapters, right? Yeah, these yeah. four practices, these four divine abodes, these yeah. four Buddhist heart attitudes or attitudes of the noble heart. Okay, we'll be right back, so thank you so much, and... Um, Namaste. Namaste. And, and kiss. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We have Lama Surya Das, and we've been talking about love. And uh, during the last couple segments, he was talking about his wonderful book, Awakening the Buddhist Heart, which I have two copies of. I like it that much. And uh, where's his? Your books are actually, you're, they're really my, some of my favorite, all time favorite books. Really? Thank you. It's yeah, very flattering. Really. They're beautiful Thank you. books. I hope it's helpful, useful. It is, it is. So um, during the last segment, we were talking about different practices to get into your heart, of which many of them are in this book. So I recommend to read the book. Um, and what I wanted to talk about in this segment is about self-love, because that's one of, I think, on the path to loving others, if you really don't love yourself, I think it's a hard it's hard for you to love others. Don't you agree? Yes, that's right. And that's a good realization. The thing is, it's not necessarily so simple, so easy. People feel, you know, for whatever reason, some focus on their uh, background and childhood. Others might talk about karma and other lives. And some might talk about environment or, you know, their social status. People don't necessarily feel that lovable, worthwhile, okay, adequate, uh, empowered. Right. And so, you know, beautiful, whatever beautiful means, outer, inner, you know, I don't have to give you a big lecture about the beauty myth in this culture, yeah. airbrush magazine pictures and TV and all and the problems girls, but also guys have with living up to that standard and having low self-esteem because of it, whether it's looks or color or hair or weight or whatever. Right. So, you know, but, but. Beauty is really internal anyway, and of course, as you get older, you realize more and more, uh, you know, the importance of the inner life, the values, the unseen, and who you are, not just what you look like or what you own or wear. Mm -hmm. But on this journey from the head to the heart, or opening the heart, awakening the mind, and spiritual oneness and meaning and purpose, I think it is very important to find a way to live from the heart and learn to love your, and accept yourself. I'm going to throw in the word accept here. Love and accept yourself so that you may, of course, feel better and be better, but also so you can love and accept and, you know, connect with and serve even 
and help and take care of others. Well, how it's did, very I mean, difficult. How, how did you do this? I mean, for, for me, what I've done to get closer to that place is address all these negative aberrant thoughts that I've had about myself that are either told to me from, you know, my parents or from teachers or whatever, you know, th thoughts that kind of somehow have sadly embedded into my head that are not self-loving thoughts and literally yes. just and examining each of those thoughts dismantling them one by one you know putting them under a microscope examining them and deciding whether i believe that they are true and giving that's them good. less power i mean that's how i yes. have gotten closer to some form of self-love how did you go get to your place of self-love uh, that was part of it and I want to say, um, since you're actively engaged in that, CJ, that's great. Um, it sounds like the work of which I recommend, Byron Katie, she calls yeah. it, in quotes, the work. You can Google yeah. it. And her four questions, you know, when you hear these is things true, out, yeah. out or in your head, is yeah. it true? How do I know it's true? Um, if would, it wasn't would true, like, yeah. how, you, you know, like, yeah. so it's like, you know, am I really, whatever your internal tyrant or harsh inner critic Right. Not just outer, but the inter internal critic we have from the past, no doubt, you know, says, like, I'm not good enough, or, you know, I can't become president, a woman can't become president, right. or, you know, whatever it is, like, I can't, you know, Oprah can do that, I can't do that. Right. You think about that, is that true? Think about where Oprah came from, a sharecropper's, you know, cabin, right. um, a rape victim, mm -hmm. and I think probably without parents, wasn't she brought up by her grandmother? Don't know. If she, you know, if Oprah can do it, you can do it. Anybody right. can do it. You know, might yeah. be the, a, a more true thought, but you, yeah. you find out. Questioning. Right. Right. So, yes, questioning. You know, as I always say, you can't believe whatever you think. It's not just you can't <laughs> believe whatever you read. Yeah. You can't just believe whatever you think. And so it's worth questioning. So there's that. So I've worked on that, and there are also spiritual traditions that are specifically about self-inquiry like Ramana Maharshi's self-inquiry tradition, where you look into who am I, what am I, am I the body, am I the mind, am I my emotions, you know, my, my role in life which changes so much every decade or whatever. So you really get to find out more deeply who you are, who you are and what you what's meaningful to you, right. and what, what you're here for, what I'm here for, what's our true calling and vocation in life, right, right livelihood, true vocation, joy path, you know, what are gifts? What gifts do we really have and how to give them so we don't die with that music locked up inside or whatever right. our gifts are? Right. So I think it's important to, you know, do that work. So me, you asked about me. Yeah. Um, I'm a 60s guy. I grew up in the 50s and 60s, went to college in the 60s. So I had all kinds of consciousness experiments. <laughs> you live in the green state of Washington, so I won't belabor the point. You understand yes. what we, we, can, we can actually smoke pot on the street now. In fact, yeah, I that's saw a bunch of teenagers are just smoking pot. It. It's awesome. Yeah, well, you're not the first ones that smoke pot on the street. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but it was illegal in America at that time. Yeah. Not in Afghanistan and right. Kathmandu and other places where yeah. I went. Yes, exactly. 1971 and on. But, you know, consciousness experiments, not just drugs. And um, inner work, gestalt workshops and encounter groups, therapy, chanting, yoga, fasting, reading spiritual psychology and, you know, philosophy. And then really getting into meditating. Uh, what Ram Das, who later became my good friend at our ashram, Ram Das, who was older than me, used to say, working on oneself. Not just selfishly, narcissistically, right. but not trying to change others. And, of course, trying to make a better world but trying to be a better person, refine ourselves, polish the inner pearl, right. dig deep, refine the gold in this ore, you know, <laughs> transmute the base lead of our animalistic nature into right. the gold of divine nature, Buddha nature. Transmute, not just change, transform, transmute the, ba the lead of our base nature, animal nature, to the gold of our sublime spiritual nature. Yeah. So. Better be like a Buddha than just be a mere Buddhist. Be like a Christ, not just a mere Christian, and so on. So we do the inner journey, the inner transformation. Become awake, enlightened, open the heart, awaken the mind, energize the spirit, energize, you know, uh, connect the community, enrich the community, serve others. Love God. Ram Das used to say in English, quoting his guru, our guru, Nimkaroli Baba. Love God, serve God, 
remember God. So love, serve, and remember. It's like love something bigger than yourself, serve something beyond the ego, and remember God. Remember that that's what it's about, not about what color your clothes are or what, you know, if it's called Allah or Jehovah, it's still the one God, and if you want to talk theism, whatever, the higher power, just it's beyond oneself. I like to call it the deeper power, the inner power. We all have it. It's in us, but it's bigger than our ego. So that's how I came to that, especially through meditation, chanting, and yoga, and Buddhist ethics and practice. Okay. Meaning uh, living it, not just studying it, but not just sitting and meditating on it, but also bring it into life through what we talked about before, good deeds, service, altruism, compassion in action, and so on, as well as meditation retreats and daily meditation, yoga training, uh, and ethics, you know. Mm-hmm character building, mm. uh, being a better person and contributing to a better world, to put it in English. All right, so I have a question That's for you. That's how. The question that keeps on pressing on my forehead that I must ask, even though it's somewhat... I can see it's kind of bulging it out is. there. Yeah, no, yeah, it wasn't something. Like third was, yeah. eye. <laughs> third eye. Third eye. All my questions manifest that way. You might need some makeup there. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, you know, in terms of um, mind versus ego versus heart and balancing all that, you know, where have you come, you know, because a lot of Buddhism is about making sure that you have control over your mind and let your heart lead and all these ideas. And yeah, I can talk to that. Yeah, I'm confused. I'm confused. What's your about, question? I'm just confused. I mean, I here's where I've more. These are just words, a placeholder. Yeah. I mean, we just talk about the mind a lot, but in the Asian language, it's the mind, heart, it's consciousness, it's spirit. Right. Spiritual consciousness is what they're talking about, not just mind. Like non-conceptual wisdom is beyond the, the thinking mind. So we're talking about spirit. Yeah. Okay. Spiritual consciousness, not the division between head and heart or emotions and intellect or left and right sides of the brain, you know, rational and intuitive. But we're talking about the holistic, like who and what you really are, deeper than the six senses. I say deeper because... Even if you're asleep, it's there. Mm-hmm. Yes, you yeah. might have dreams. And even if you're in a coma, it's there because you're alive. Right. Now, what you call it is a matter of great discussion and controversy over the millennia. Okay. And I think it, So I'm not saying it's a something, this or that. I'm saying the animating principle. It's beyond the senses and beyond the mind. You could be in a coma, but you're still alive. So what is it when you're in a coma? And then some people hear things in a coma and they remember them later because, right. it, you know, there's consciousness, even in the unconsciousness, there's some lucidity. Right. That's why it's called the inner light or the clear light, we call it in Tibetan. Oh, so the clear light. So that's what we're talking about, not the thinking mind, the conceptual mind, not just the heart. Like I feel is not that different from I think because we're just talking on like a superficial, almost visible level. Right. You know, it's visible to our thoughts. It's kind of still a little superficial. Right. Yeah. Right. But like, where are you really coming from? Right. Like your worldview is a lot different than I think this or that. Right. And I think it's confusing because, you know, you talk to a lot of, because when you just read the words, it's, it's, it, yes. it, it, it doesn't go beyond. So I'm like, well, am I really trying to wrestle my mind to the ground? And like, no. why would I want to do that? Like, I like exactly. parts of my mind. I think Those that's are good questions. But then at the same time, do I want my heart leading all the time, which is unnecessarily all good yeah, question. So, I don't know. Those are the kind of questions that I that I struggle yeah. with, where I think, well, well, you should ask your spiritual teacher or, or read up on it and see what other people have said about those same questions. Yeah, I think it's some combination. Well, I just think of it as in a, in a yoga and a just and intellectually, I think, well, it has to be all three. It has to be mind, body, spirit. It's all three. Mind, body, things. spirit, it's or all, whatever you want. You know, integral spirituality. Yeah, is kind of got, I, I want about. all it's, not, it's a very good way of thinking, integral spirituality. Yeah. So it includes body and soul. It includes mind and body. It includes energy and psyche. Yeah. It includes the unconscious as well as the you know conscious mind. Yeah. If I have it includes a- dreams and visions and intuitions and things on the edge of our consciousness yes. like dreams you know you can do dream yoga we call it tibetan dream yoga yeah lucid dreaming psychology calls it today where you awaken within the dream and know you're asleep right then you can play with it you're a master magician master rather than victim 
of right. the circumstances and conditions in your dream. Because you know you're dreaming and it's just a dream, so you can fly or you can manifest things. And then that ca power carries over into the daily life. You realize that you can be master rather than victim of circumstances and conditions. Mm -hmm. It's not what happens to you, but what you make of it that makes all the difference. So yeah. you gain more self-mastery. This is not just about being a control freak or, or, or mind, wrestling your mind to the ground. For example, today, popular Buddhism in the West, and I just emphasize that, this is not really in the old world so much, but popular Buddhism in the West is focused almost entirely, maybe too much, on mindfulness. Mindfulness means being aware of whatever comes up, not wrestling your mind to the ground. Being aware of thoughts mm -hmm. is mindful meditation. Being aware of feelings is mindful meditation. So that you can choose, and you're not just led by your habitual reactions. Right. That I and actually a that moment actually... to choose between stimulus and response. You how to respond with awareness, let's say intelligently, intentionally, rather than just blindly react. There's a difference between responding and reacting. Yeah. And mindfulness gives you the space to choose. We have more mind space between the stimulus and the re and the reaction. Yeah. So that's a very moment to moment practice. You can practice sitting down like meditation or walking mindfully, but you can also practice it while eating or talking or even in your dreams. Yeah. I think it's good to find a way that resonates and not just resonates, but works yeah. for you, for oneself, yeah. for you yeah. and your partner and your life. And if you want to know if it's working for you, if it's making a better person or not, ask your husband, he'll tell you. <laughs> That's a great litmus test. All right, thank you. So in the next segment, we're going to end with a beautiful chant. I can't wait. Yay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Okay.